The growth of the skeleton determines the size and the proportion of your body. The bony skeleton begins to form at about six weeks after fertilization when the embryo is about a half inch long. At this stage, the existing skeletal elements are cartilaginous. They're actually hyaline cartilage. During development, the bones undergo an increase in size. Bone growth continues through adolescence and portions of the skeleton generally don't stop growing until about age 25. Two major forms of ossification are endochondral ossification and intramembranous ossification. In endochondral ossification, bone replaces existing cartilage. In intramembranous ossification, bone develops directly from mesenchyme, which is embryonic tissue, or from a fibrous connective tissue. During development, most bones originate as hyaline cartilages that are miniature models of the corresponding bones of the adult skeleton. These cartilage models are gradually replaced by bone through the process of endochondral ossification. We'll look at the steps in a limb bone development. By the time the embryo is six weeks old, the proximal bone of the limb is present but composed entirely of hyaline cartilage. This cartilage model continues to grow by expansion of the cartilage matrix, which we call interstitial growth, and the production of new cartilage at the outer surface, which we call appositional growth. The steps are as follows. In step one, as the cartilage enlarges, chondrocytes near the center of the shaft begin to greatly increase in size. The cells start to enlarge, their lacuna expand, and the matrix is reduced to a series of thin struts. These thin struts soon begin to calcify. Now the enlarged chondrocytes are deprived of nutrients because diffusion can't occur through this calcified cartilage. These chondrocytes become surrounded by calcified cartilage and they die and then disintegrate. In step two, blood vessels grow into the perichondrium surrounding the shaft of the cartilage. Now the perichondrium surrounds cartilage. We had heard about periosteum that surrounded bone. It's the same dense irregular connective tissue, but because it's surrounding cartilage, we call it perichondrium instead of periosteum, which surrounds bone. The perichondrium has an inner cellular layer, and the cells of this inner layer of the perichondrium differentiate into osteoblasts. These osteoblasts begin producing a thin layer of bone around the shaft of the cartilage. Now we'll call the perichondrium periosteum because it covers bone rather than cartilage and we end up with a thin sheath of bone in the diaphysis that's surrounded by periosteum. While these changes are underway, the blood supply to the periosteum increases and capillaries and fibroblasts migrate into the heart of the cartilage, invading the spaces left by the disintegrating chondrocytes. The calcified cartilaginous matrix breaks down and the fibroblasts differentiate into osteoblasts. The osteoblasts will replace the cartilage the osteoblast will replace the calcified cartilage with spongy bone. Bone development begins at this site and is called the primary ossification center. This bone development spreads towards both ends of the cartilaginous model. In this stage, the diameter of the diaphysis is small and it's filled with spongy bone and there is no medullary cavity. In step four, as the bone enlarges, osteoclasts appear and begin eroding the trabeculae in the center of the diaphysis, creating a medullary cavity. Further growth involves two distinct processes, an increase in length of bone and an enlargement in the diameter of the bone. The enlargement in diameter we call appositional growth. In step five, the next major change occurs when the centers of the epiphyses begin to calcify. Capillaries and osteoblasts migrate into these areas creating secondary ossification centers. The appearance of these secondary ossification centers varies from one bone to another and from individual to individual. Secondary ossification centers may occur at birth in bones like the humerus, the femur, and the tibia, but the ends of some other bones such as those in the fingers remain cartilaginous until early adulthood. The epiphyses eventually become filled with spongy bone a thin cap of the original cartilage model remains exposed to the joint cavity as articular cartilage. This cartilage prevents damage from bone-to-bone -bone contact within the joint. At the metaphysis, a relatively narrow cartilaginous region called the epiphyseal cartilage or epiphyseal plate now separates the epiphysis from the diaphysis. 
The epiphyseal cartilage is also known as the growth plate. This micrograph shows the interface between the degenerating cartilage and the advancing osteoblast. As long as the epiphyseal cartilage continues to grow at its epiphyseal surface, the bone will continue to increase in length. At puberty, the combination of rising levels of hormones, growth hormone, and thyroid hormone stimulates bone growth dramatically. Osteoblasts begin producing bone faster than the chondrocytes are producing new epiphyseal cartilage. As a result, the osteoblasts catch up and the epiphyseal cartilage gets narrower and narrower until it ultimately disappears. The timing of the osteoblast catching up with the cartilaginous growth can be monitored by comparing the width of the epiphyseal cartilages in successive x-rays. In adults, the former location of this cartilage is often detectable in x-rays as a distinct epiphyseal line, which remains after epiphyseal growth has ended. The completed epiphyseal growth is called epiphyseal closure. As we said earlier, a superficial layer of bone forms early in endochondral ossification. The developing bone increases in diameter through the process of appositional growth at the outer surface. In this process, cells of the inner layer of the periosteum differentiate into osteoblasts and deposit superficial layers of bone matrix. Eventually, these osteoblasts become surrounded by matrix and differentiate into osteocytes. Over much of the surface, appositional growth adds a series of layers that form circumferential lamellae. In time, the deep circumferential lamellae are recycled and replaced by osteons typical of compact bone. Here we see the circumferential lamellae that are produced by appositional growth. We can also see the osteons that are produced during endochondral ossification, as well as lamellae called interstitial lamellae that fill in in between the osteons. Over much of the surface, appositional growth adds a series of layers that form circumferential lamellae. In time, the deepest circumferential lamellae are recycled and replaced by osteons, typical of compact bone. However, blood vessels and collagen fibers of the periosteum can sometimes become enclosed within the matrix produced by osteoblasts. Osteons may then form around the smaller vessels. While bone matrix is being added to the outer surface of the growing bone, Osteoclasts are removing bone matrix at the inner surface at a slower rate. In order for bones to grow and to be maintained, they require an extensive blood supply. Osseous tissue is highly vascular. In a typical bone such as the humerus, three major sets of blood vessels develop. The nutrient artery and vein are the blood vessels that supply the diaphysis and are formed by invading the cartilage model as endochondral ossification begins. Most bones have only one nutrient artery and one nutrient vein, but a few bones, including the femur, have more than one of each. The vessels enter the bone through one or more round passageways called nutrient foramina in the diaphysis. Branches of these larger vessels form smaller perforating canals and extend along the length of the shaft into the osteons of the surrounding cortex. The metaphyseal vessels supply blood to the inner surface of each epiphyseal cartilage, where the cartilage is being replaced by bone. The periosteal vessels are blood vessels from the periosteum that provide blood to the superficial osteons of the shaft. During endochondral bone formation, branches of the periosteal vessels also enter the epiphyses, providing blood to the secondary ossification centers. Following the closure of the epiphyses, all three sets of vessels become extensively interconnected. The periosteum also contains an extensive network of lymphatic vessels and sensory nerves. The sensory nerves penetrate the cortex with the nutrient artery to innervate the endosteum, medullary cavity, and epiphyses. Because of these nerves, injuries to the bones are usually very painful.